Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we had a little bit of feedback there, but I think I caught it and got rid of it. So uh, welcome to the show. Um, it's going to be a great show this evening, and I hope you all out there are safe, healthy, and happy. And this show is a place to go where you can escape from the news. Um, to We're going to be discussing some, discussing some really interesting topics, and uh it's just going to be a great evening. So uh, anyway, I was just thinking the other day, I, I checked my horoscope. Let me just, yeah, my horoscope says you'll be spending a lot of time at home. Wow. It's, uh, it's similar to the one uh, that I had last week, and they're really nailing it uh, lately. So I know that was my attempt at humor. But about the show, the first segment is with Travis Taylor. Uh, his friends call him Doc Taylor. Um, and there's a reason why he has multiple PhDs in optical science and engineering, aerospace systems engineering, and a master's degree in physics and astronomy. Wow. Wowza, that's all I can say. I was just speaking with him. He had 26 years of school. Isn't that something? Uh, for the last 25 years, um, Taylor has worked on various high-tech programs for the Department of the Defense and NASA. He'll be discussing the new series, uh, which is the lead scientist, um, and the name of that show is called The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. It's premiering tonight on History, uh, Tuesday, March 31st, 10, uh, 9 Central. Do not miss it. The next two segments after that is with Leslie Kane, and she's a respected journalist and one of the co-authors of the New York Times article December 16th, 2017, we all know what happened there, uh, when the world's attention turned to UFOs. So we're going to discuss behind the scenes of how that came about and what has changed um, ever since that. Uh, I have a friend um, who has a daughter that is being, uh, I think they call it remote schooling now. Um, she's at home uh, learning remotely. And my friend uh, texted me and said, you can't believe what they're talking about. In the third grade class, uh, they're talking about UFOs. And uh, so that, that um, graphic is up on uh, YouTube if you're watching at YouTube. It's also going to be in the show notes and check it out. And they even go so far as to list um, Luis Elizondo um, in that. So uh, check that out. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty great. Um, so also... Um, while you're looking at the show notes over at podcastufo.com, um, there's a great blog by Michael Lauk over there called Faded Discs. And there are links to some really awesome vintage UFO encounter interviews, you know, from all the way back, uh, you know, 50, 60 years old. So uh, check that out over there. Also, um, some of you actually listen to my other podcast. I do a, a podcast on antiques, art auctions, things like that. That website is called the Antique, it's antiqueauctionforum.com. And I'll be dropping a podcast over there in the next couple of days. A number of you have said you wanted to be more distracted and wanted me to do more podcasts. Um, so I'm doing this one a week, and hopefully I'll be able to do more of the antiques. I know a lot of people are not interested in antiques and fine art and all that. But um, I don't believe I'm going to be starting another show. It's really hard to get guests um, once a week, it would be really difficult to get in more than that. But I do appreciate all the nice um, email that I've been getting. Um, some people really rely on the show, uh, especially right now. So um, I'm really happy to do it and happy to be with you all tonight. Um, thank you all for supporting the show. Uh, we're actually on Patreon now. And I believe that is just enough for me. Uh, I'm going to bring on my guest, uh, Travis. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yes, and you're um, you're somewhere really warm. I can tell, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> you're down south. Um, yeah, I'm in uh, North Alabama, uh, not far from Huntsville, where the rockets that went to the moon were constructed. Oh wow, wow! And what a background you have. Uh, it's unbelievable. Um, all the time you spend in school. Did you, did you have a social life during that time? Twenty six <laughs> years. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I was in a couple of uh, rock bands, and I uh, uh, did some mountain bike racing and uh, ran some marathons and things like that. But yeah. I, I, I did all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
you know, I want to talk tonight. Uh, the new series is coming out in just uh, you know for the first time. The premiere is coming out in just a few hours tonight, um, ten uh, nine central, on the on history. And I wanted to talk um, for the the person that's just. There's a lot of people just starting to listen about this UFO topic in general. But so a lot of people are not aware at all of the Skinwalker Ranch. Never heard of it. Um, can you go into the details about that, please? Yeah, sure. There's this uh, ranch that's uh, in the middle of a place called the Uinta Basin. It's in Utah. It's about a three-hour drive due east of Salt Lake City Airport. And I know that because I did that many times over the process of, uh, of filming the show and doing the research out there. Uh, the ranch is dead center in this basin. And if you look at Google Earth, at Utah, you'll see this big giant gouge in Utah. And it looks to me like millions of years ago or whenever this occurred, there was a meteor impact and it created the entire basin there in the mountains. And uh, you can even see where it, it came in from the east and hit the, the earth and, and threw salt uh, and created the salt flats out to the west. Now, for thousands of years, and we know this because there are petroglyphs from the natives out there, People have been claiming to see things in the sky, claiming that there were, you know, other odd phenomena uh, happening out there. And then about 100 or so, 200 years ago, the Navajos and the Utes got into a, a squabble of, uh, it's probably, I would call it a war, actually. Uh, and the uh, U.S. Cavalry was involved, too, because they caused the Utes to, uh, to, to migrate. And during this process, uh, the Navajos put a curse on the property uh, so that the, it was protected by a shape-shifting creature called a skinwalker. And then uh, the Utes think it's something different. The Utes actually think that it's their sky god that's protecting them, and uh, uh, it's, it's their, and it is the god that they say brings them from one trial and tribulation to their next level of evolution. But at any rate, in the uh, 90s or so, Bob Bigelow of Bigelow Airspace, and that you may have heard of him from the uh, recent releases about the ATIP program where the Pentagon had a UFO uh, in investigation program. Uh, actually, it was more like airspace threats. But uh, at any rate, uh, Bigelow uh, owned the ranch for about two decades, and he had a team of scientists out there, uh, and they never released any information about whatever it was Bigelow seemed to find, except for George Knapp and uh, Colm Kelleher uh, wrote this book, and George Knapp's been going around doing YouTube videos and conferences and stuff like that. But uh, what we're getting from them are stories of fantastic, crazy things. Well, in t uh, 2016, Bigelow sold the ranch to a new owner, uh, Brandon Fugel, who I, you know, I think it, we finally released who he was, and they'll talk about him on the show. He's a, it's another billionaire from Utah, and uh, he uh, wanted to put a team together to dig into the research and let the world know the data when they found it, instead of it being some obscure lost uh, mechanism that whatever Bigelow did. We have no idea what Bigelow found. Uh, all, except for what he's claimed in various speeches and stuff. No scientific data has been released. Well, that's not what we're doing on the show. We've got a camera crew 24-7 uh, following us around while we're doing the research, and, uh, and anything we see or find, as long as the owner says we can release it, which he always has, uh, then it's, it's going to the public. So that's the general premise of the show. Uh-huh. Now, I know you can't talk, um, you know, you can't really spoil um, a lot of the things that are going on there. But can you talk about, um, I was able to watch the screener a couple of shows. And uh, can you talk about some of the things um, that uh, you find peculiar right off the bat there? <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. Uh, so right off the bat, I wasn't there 15 or 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes at most. Uh, when strange things started happening, I did. When I went out there, I went out with the uh, scientific skepticism that okay, maybe there's a natural phenomenon that caused people to hallucinate or see weird things or cause some 
some problem, or maybe there's a classified government program going on somewhere nearby that's having a side effect that would explain the sightings of UFOs and strange things in the sky. Who knows? But that wouldn't explain what the uh, Utes and the Navajos claim and what the the uh, petroglyphs from all around claim has been there for uh, thousands of years. But I thought I would figure something out. Within 30 minutes of being there, I was seeing phenomena that I could not explain. I was scientifically measuring them with scientific instruments and could not point to a direction as to where these phenomena were coming from. And uh, now, you know, the, the story, I read the book, you were just talking about George Knapp and uh, Kelleher that wrote the book, and uh, I read that book several years ago, and I, the thing that fascinated me was the gigantic, um, like, wolf-dog type creature that was, uh, you know, attacking a cow, trying to pull its head through. This was with the family that uh, actually owned the ranch at the time trying to pull the, the calves, I think it was, head through the fence, and they shot it, and I guess shot it several times, and, and they found no blood, right? Is that is that right? Is that story right? Did you ever? Well, that's the story. The story's got a lot more to it than, to, honestly, uh, me and the, the current team that's out there, we, the, we, while they, one of the guys is the ranch hand, the ranch manager, and he's local, and he actually knows this family, and he, he doesn't believe that they're tall tale type people, but at the same time, not, the story, a lot of it doesn't make sense. So the story goes like this, this giant wolf, bigger than any wolf they've ever seen, just wanders up to them right as the first day they kind of move the cows in. And, and they, they walk up and they actually, the family actually goes up and, and is, it, it's like friendly, like a dog with them. And then all of a sudden, a calf sticks its head through the fence, and it sees the calf, and it goes nuts like a shark smells blood and water, I guess. Jumps on the calf and starts trying to pull it out of the, uh, the fence. So the son runs to the truck, pulls out a 357 Magnum, gives it to the father. The father shoots the thing several times. Doesn't really affect it. It's still trying to kill the calf. So then they run in the house. All this time now, they've shot a bunch of time. They run in the house, they get a 30 out 6 and they come back out and they shoot it with a 30 out 6 and and then, and, but all they claim that there's a piece of flesh that's left over, but there's no blood, and then it just wanders off, and then they follow its tracks trying to hunt it down, and it goes to the middle of the field uh, down by the river, and and then they never see it. See, the tracks just vanish in thin air. Well, so let me tell you my perspective and, and the show's perspective on this. That's a story. It's a campfire story, it's a ghost story, it's a story like my grandmother would tell me as a kid on Halloween. It's not a story that we can do anything scientifically to find out if it was if it really happened or not. I'm sure the uh, Shermans believe it happened to them, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to go into whether I think something was making them hallucinate or it was real or what. I have no idea. And so I'm not even going to try and, and, and place any scientific judgment on the caliber of the story. All I want to do is go out there, and if there's a phenomena, measure it with every scientific uh, instrument that we can get our hands on and try and understand what's causing this phenomena. But now I will say there's all kind of crazy, creepy stories out there that if you let your imagination wander, like the story about this dire wolf, it will creep you out. But that's not the point of being there. We're not there to be creeped out. We're out there to find out what the answer to this strange mystery is. Right. I was uh, I was on the call uh, with you, the press call with you last Friday, and I remember someone talked to you, asked you a question about what type of paranormal things did you see out there, and, and can you describe, you, you're saying there's no, you don't believe the word is paranormal is a, a fitting word. Yes. Uh, so paranormal means something that's, that's not normal to this universe. Well, if we see things happening within the universe, then it must be normal to it. It just may be something that we don't understand. And we, we create this box of what we believe normal is, which is uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a small, narrow-minded, actually egocentric thing to do, that we think just because we created the box that we said is normal, that all the normal stuff has to fit in that box. Well, Humanity has only been around for, you know, so many tens to hundreds of thousands of years where they're actually having critical thought, as far as we know, anyway. Uh, and, and then 
Um, so how do we know in a universe that's 13.7 billion years old what normal really is? Hmm. It be a phenomenon that's just physics that we've yet to understand. And uh, now, mm -hmm. if it does come from another universe, well, I don't know if you'd call that paranormal or not. It's the same thing that uh, my uh, good friend, uh, uh, the rabbi Ariel Barzadok, he always says, uh, you know, angels and demons and gods, by definition, are extraterrestrial. So that's some way to think about that. Right, right. Um, now, um, Eric Davis, when he was there, he, he claims he saw this portal that opened and this creature came out of it that was in the book but um so you're saying there's really nothing docu truly documented about a situation like that is that what i'm well so here's the thing if there is a scientific uh evidentiary document or any of the data for that event uh nobody in the has ever seen it now i've spoken with eric davis about it and eric said it happened and they were using he told me what instruments they were using and so on but again and eric agrees with me on this uh is that without the data uh, that you can release to the scientific community for them to scrutinize it then uh, you know it doesn't really mean anything it may as well not have happened if you can't show that it did and that's why we're putting every bit of the data right there in front of everybody uh, that, that when we get it, we're showing it. We're saying, hey, look, this is what we're seeing. Uh, if it's crazy, then that, that's, that's what we got. Now, I know uh, I heard, and I don't know if this can be confirmed, but for many years, um, you know, after the research was done there, um, that things just stopped happening, but they're happening again. That's that's uh, as soon as uh, Brandon bought it, right? Or soon well, after. You know, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. We don't know the answer to that. So here's what we do know. Uh, Bigelow says that, but uh, the last six to seven years that he owned it, at least according to witnesses that we've spoken to who work for him, the only people on the ranch were security guards. Hmm. And the security guards tell us that stuff did happen and they would send reports to Bigelow through fax all the time. But, uh, uh, Bigelow had moved on. I think at that point he was either maybe working on the a -tip program and, or he was building his inflatable habitat that he was trying to get uh, connected to the space station. Right. Um, one of the things I, you know, I had Jeremy Corbell on to talk about Skinwalker and I apologize to the listener. We tried to fix this uh, feedback coming through. It just was no way to change it. So we had to move on. Um, so Jeremy wanted to make a point, and I'm sure you want to make this point now because you want to be on there. Do you want to, uh, you know, elaborate a little more on that? I cannot emphasize this enough, and I really appreciate you bringing this up. So let me tell you, we've had people have serious injuries, uh, including myself. Uh, I got radiation sickness. Really? And uh, uh, right. during those experiments might could even be dangerous if you were to get in them and we don't know you're there. But worst case, or, or minimal worst case, is uh, you taint the experiment, and we think we found something we didn't. Another uh, incident might be that uh, you get out there, and the place is naturally dangerous with snakes and mountain lions and cave-ins and caves and holes in the ground and, and wolves and, and, and so on. You could get hurt naturally, and there's nobody out there that could find you and help you except for us. And it's a 500-acre ranch. Unless we just happen to see you or hear you on one of our sensors, you could be stuck out there for a long time. But then, whatever this phenomena is, it's a real thing, and it's it can be potentially harmful because we don't know what it is and why it's doing what it's doing. You could get out there and get an exposure, whether it's a toxic or an intoxicating type exposure that could cause you serious harm or maybe even death. Please do not go out there as a thrill seeker trying to get on the ranch or to sneak a peek at what's going on. Look, we got cameras that are wide open, going to be there. In fact, uh, the last 12 hours, there's been live cameras on the Internet for you to look at and see. And all this is going on the show. Uh, you know, so trust us. 
that we're not doing some crazy conspiracy cover-up thing. We're showing you what we find. Now, the the property backs up to Native American lands, and I'm wondering if other people are suffering from radiation sickness. Have you ever heard of that? Well, so here's the thing. Um, yeah, we really do not believe that whatever this phenomena is cares about the little barbed wire fences that, that mankind has put up to keep its cows in. And uh, we certainly think that whatever's happening on the 500 acres in the middle of this basin is happening all around. And we have spoken with witnesses who have shown similar symptoms and didn't know what it was that was wrong with them. And we believe it could be the same phenomenon. Uh, we haven't got definitive scientific proof of that yet. And when we do, certainly we'll let everybody know because uh, we actually spoke uh, with some people from the uh, Utah governor's office uh, because uh, we, we want everybody to know if there is something going on out there that turns out to be dangerous it's imperative that we find out what it is and let everybody know okay i know we okay. only have a couple of minutes here so i have a couple of quick questions uh to fire at you first of all um did you have any ufo sightings while you were there we saw a bunch of things and it's all on camera and scientific instruments and i just don't want to spoil it for you but i will tell you this you will be absolutely amazed and excited and thrilled from what we found and saw and we'll be showing you on on the show. Uh, all right. That's that's good. I'm definitely going to be tuning in. And uh, scientific instruments. Um, we have a scientist that just actually uh, texted me, wanted to, wanted to know what you were using there. Uh, we've used everything from multiple RF sensors and microwave sensors and spectrum analyzers across the... Uh, radio and uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. We've used infrared and visible sensors. We use gravitational sensors and uh, gamma ray and x-ray detectors and particle counters. And uh, we've also looked for toxic gases and chemicals and biological uh, uh, volatile organic compounds and so on. And we have instruments of all sorts that we used on the ground, in the ground, in the sky, uh, in the water, every, everything we can think of. And, and, you know, I have to say, we did what was uh, a thorough research, but we're just getting started. Great. Well, thanks so much. And uh, check out History Tonight at uh, 10, 9 Central. Thanks so much, uh, Travis. It's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you very much. All right. All right. So, everyone, hang on. We'll be right back. Um, we are going to go into a break, and uh, we'll be right back right after these messages. All righty. Welcome back. And now I'm back with our guest for the next two segments, uh, Leslie Kane. Welcome to the show, Leslie. Thanks, Martin. Hello to everybody who's listening. Uh, Leslie, I always love talking to you. Um, I just really enjoy, uh, you know, I, I met you in... Uh, North Carolina many years ago now it is, uh, but uh, always wonderful to talk to you. I, I love what you do, and uh, thank you. And I'm really glad that you could come back. Um, Thanks, Martin. I've had a lot of people that have uh, been requesting that you come on the show for quite a while now. Of course, right after you uh, wrote the article um, back on December 16, 2017, the Pentagon. Uh, what was the title of the uh, Aurora's? How did that go? Uh, the headline, you mean? Yes. Uh, gosh, you know what? Well, the, the the one in the print edition actually was the one I liked better. And that <laughs> headline was "Real UFOs?" Question mark. Pentagon unit tried to know. That's actually what I have sitting here sitting here right now in front of me. The wow. print edition. So Pentagon unit tried to know. So, but the one online it was something like glowing auras and oh yeah, my gosh, right. you know what? I don't even remember. But I. I think they took it. They took some of the language that we use to describe one of the videos. I'm going to have to dig that out while we're talking here. Yeah, I mean, um, if anybody, if if it's because you want people to be able to look it up right now, if they just put in New York Times UFOs, uh, it'll come right up. That's right. It's something like glowing auras and ghostly something or others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, it is. It's glowing auras and black money, colon the Pentagon's mysterious, and then it kind of. Mysterious, I don't know. Uh, uh, mysterious we, UFO a, program. Da -da. 
finally. We, we journalists have no say in the headlines. Yes. Just so people know that. <laughs> um, and of course the big, you know, the big, one of the big components of that story was the videos. And, um, even though I love the print edition, I like the headline better. Of course, the only way to see the videos is to go on the computer. Well, I will tell you that some people that have told me that I'm silly for doing the show on UFOs that know me in the antiques world and all that, uh, fine arts and all that, but you know, they're still my friends, but they're just kind of like get a chuckle out of it. Um, mm -hmm. they have said to me. Wow, uh, there's really something, huh? <laughs> because of that, that's you know, it it makes me yeah. In my professional field, I have been much more relaxed about bringing that topic up ever since that came out. So a lot has changed. Yeah, I think that's true for so many people, and it it's something that reached people that aren't normally even interested in the topic. You know, so you can just run into anyone. I mean, I run into people in New York who just are working someplace I'm going or the topic comes up and they know about this article, you know, or I went and did did interviews for my my newest book that had nothing to do with UFOs. And people in various studios knew about the article. They just didn't know I had anything to do with it. So it's just sort of out there in the culture in a way mm -hmm. that very few things actually you know, become like that. Um, so right. I think it has it's made it way easier, as you say for people to feel comfortable talking about it. And I'm happy that it had that effect. You know, I just talked about this on my last show, but I still, I'll still bring it up because I never told you this. But right after that article came out, I was flying um, on American Airlines, and there was a, uh, sitting next to a real nice gentleman, we had a great conversation, ended up, he was a, a pilot for American Airlines, and he was deadheading to another, you know, location to fly out of, uh, not in uniform or anything. And uh, so, I asked him if he saw the New York Times article, and he said, no, I missed that. But you know what? He says, they're real, I can tell you that. <laughs> and then he <laughs> told me a story about being in a um, F-18 Hornet or whatever it was, and a green orb following him for, for a long time. And, uh, and wow. he said that he was afraid to talk about it. But I think, you know, things, the things that have changed is people aren't so afraid to talk about it. Um, as it used to be. I think that's true, but I still think we got a long way to go, and there still are people who are afraid to talk about it for various reasons, but um, I still think it made a big step forward, that story. Um, and then same with the one that came in, out in May of 2019 about the uh, USS Roosevelt. That also helped the situation a lot. So it, it's just a very slow process. It's also frustrating, you know, because it's so slow. Right. Uh, I but, think that that's the same for everyone, especially in that people are paying, you know, in the UFO field, so to speak, or whatever you want to call it. It, you know, people wanted more. Come on, more. You know, let's keep going with this. Um, we're on a roll type of thing. Um, but you, you, you can't just put you can't put false information. You got to put it out when it when it when you can and when it comes along. That's right. I mean, especially writing for something like the New York Times that has such a high bar, yeah. you know, for anything they publish. And everything has to be, uh, you know, you have to have at least two people on the record. And, you know, there's all kinds of uh, everything has to be documented. Everything has to be checked out. And it's got to be the, a certain kind of story to, to land in the New York Times. And um, that's the thing. So people wonder, well, how come we, we journalists at the Times haven't done more? Well, we're constantly looking for the kinds of story that we could bring to the Times. We'd like nothing more than to do to do more. But um, there's only a certain level of story that will get there. And it usually has to be, I, mean, I would say probably for us, pretty much always has to either be tied to the military or the government to even be considered. Um, and then it has to be something really new and exciting that hasn't been covered other places. And, you know, so... It's it's uh, just not that easy. And but on the other uh, reverse side of that coin is that if we do get something in the times because of these very things I'm talking about, it makes a huge impact because it's the paper of record and people know that when something's in the time, it really it really means something. So it's worth it to me to have to wait. But also, but mm -hmm. you know, because then then the impact is is much bigger than it would be anywhere else. But you know, it's very hard to find the kind of material that they can they can include. So that's the dilemma. Right. And um, Ralph Blumenthal has been 
on this show previous. Uh, thanks to you. He actually connected me with him when he had that Vanity Fair article uh, and revol- uh, involving uh, John Mack. He came out with that several years ago, mm-hmm. and he was a co-author. So was Helene Cooper, and um, I believe that's who it is, right? Yes, with and, the three and, of us. we did. Yes. Yep. And Helene was on uh, the uh, New York Times has a great podcast called The Daily, and they did a show also on that, and uh, that was really great. I don't know. You must have caught that, did you? I do remember that because I remember Helene didn't really like – there was so much demand for media after this story mm-hmm. came out. She didn't doesn't really like doing it. <laughs> Plus, she's full-time with the New York Times, and, you know, she's being assigned 20,000 stories at once, you know. She doesn't have a lot of time either, but um, she – I think that was one of the few things she did because it was a New York Times podcast. I do remember. And that's – she's a Pentagon a correspondent or something, right? She's a very high level lady at the New York Times. Absolutely. She's I think she's she's won prizes. She's their their Pentagon Pentagon uh liaison, Pentagon correspondent or, or you know, reporter. So uh we were so lucky, Ralph and I, when when they accepted our story to be uh handed, you know, to be told that Helene Cooper would be working with us. I mean we couldn't have asked for a better person, and she's the one that has the connections to the Pentagon and was able to set up an interview with Harry Reid and, you know, was really uh, able to contribute a huge amount and kind of oversee the whole article because she's the one in the New York Times office, mm-hmm. whereas Ralph and I are, are freelancers, so it's it's different. She was absolutely central to the article being able to be brought forward. Right, and uh, in the podcast... She talks about meeting um, in this diner with uh, Lou Elizondo and how, um, you know, she, I remember she said something about, you know, he kept looking, he was sitting in a place where no one could be behind him, and he kept, like, looking around to you make, make sure no one was there, you know, like he was nervous to talk about uh-huh. this uh, with her. But um, I remember uh, Michael Barbara, the uh, inter- interviewer, um, asked her, uh, well, do you think he's legitimate? And she said, yes. And um, mm-hmm. she said something about riding on the train back, um, her thoughts were, but um, like it was crazy, but it, there was really something to it. Um, yeah. I mean, I was with her then. We, uh, Ralph and I both joined her for that interview with Elizondo. In the, I remember that. And I took the train with her from the New York Times office, and I took the train back with her. And it's true. I mean, he, Elizondo, Lou Elizondo was, was really nervous in those days, and he was a bit frightened. He didn't know what kind of repercussions might befall him as a result of coming out like this. And so I remember he, he, was, he, always, he would sit with his back to the wall always at a table that was sort of in a corner, you know, or kind of a – but a table that was against the wall. And where he could see the door at all times, those were his two requirements. So I remember her being struck by that. Oh, yes, he was just yes. always on the lookout, you know, and uh, he didn't know if, if he was being surveilled or if somebody might be watching him or what was, you know, he was just in a very, a very vulnerable state at that time. Are you surprised that he's never had any known repercussions? I've never heard of any. And uh, when I spoke to him, he never mentioned any. Well, I think he's had some harassment, um, but, you know, maybe it's not something he wants to talk about publicly, but. I mean, so I, I can't really comment on that. I think he's you know, he's had some pushback from various places, maybe within the DOD or whatever. Uh, but nothing, I don't think anything super serious. But uh, I don't think it was easy for him those first six months. And I think he was nervous and understandably so about what he was doing, you know, coming out with this information and writing this letter to the Secretary of Defense and... Uh, exposing the existence of a program that was supposed to be kept secret. It, 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 he, it was a big, big deal for somebody to do that. And I, I admired his courage. I thought he was taking a risk, and he, he knew he was taking a risk. Mm-hmm. So it's understandable he would have been sort of on the lookout, especially being an intelligence officer who's kind of used to being in dangerous situations. You know, he's kind of primed for uh, being on the lookout in a certain way. Yeah, when I met him down in... Um Cherry Hill, uh, a couple summers ago, I guess it was, he, you know, basically when, uh, before I met him, I watched him, uh, you know, at, at a talk he did. He basically said, don't trust me, you know, check the facts, you know, uh, 
you know, he said, I don't, I don't blame anyone who uh, wants to look into things that, that doesn't want to take my word for something. You know, check it all out yourself, that type of thing. Do you think there has been um, um, anything to, you know, I mean, there is a lot of controversy. There has been, you know, since, since day one. Um, I guess we can just talk about that a little bit. Do you think that there's a lot of people in the UFO field that felt, oh, I don't know, maybe left out because they've been working so hard all these years, you know, trying to get information and then, you know, out of nowhere this happened? I have no idea how people were feeling. I really don't, Martin. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I just know that all I was concerned about was doing my job of getting the story out. And I mean, everybody in the UFO field contributes to things like this happening because it's a conglomeration of work that goes on and work that comes out. And, you know, I, I too had spent many, many years working on this, this topic. Um, and, I was a journalist that happened to have this connection to the New York Times, so I was the logical person for them to approach. And, and I knew some of the people. It wasn't Elizondo who actually came to me. It was his some of his associates, and they were people that I had known for a long time, and they trusted me. So the process seemed um, very natural at the time, you know, and they knew that, that perhaps I could get it into the New York Times, which would be the number one choice. Oh, so can so, we you go? Know, I, yeah. I can't comment on how anybody else would feel about that, yeah. but I, I, I think people, everyone was pretty excited about it when it happened, as far as I know. All right, so if we could, let's let's step back, and if we could, we could start from the beginning of how this whole thing um, came about. Um, I know, I think, believe it was October, hmm, sometime in October of that same year, um, there had the uh, to the Stars Academy. They had their little uh, video conference. And basically, this stuff was coming out during their video conference. And then from that point on, can you explain how that story, that article came together? Yeah, I mean, actually, the way it all started was I was invited to a meeting in Washington to meet Lou Elizondo by these three uh, colleagues of his who I'd known for a long time. And I think, um, I mean, if I, I don't think it's a secret. Um, the, the two of, it was Christopher Mellon and Hal Putoff and Jim Semivan who were there. And I think it was Christopher Mellon who actually made the invitation. But um, this, this meeting happened before the press conference in which they announced the existence of To the Stars. So this was in October, this was on October 4th, and that meeting was October 11th. And I didn't know a whole lot about To the Stars at that point. I mean, I went there specifically to meet Lou Elizondo, and I had known Christopher Mellon for years. I had known Hal Putoff for years. So, uh, you know, it was the, I was focused more on the individuals involved than I was To the Stars. And then about a week later, they did the press conference and announced the existence of To the Stars. And we just kept on pursuing the article where Lou Elizondo was our main source, because we were writing about the existence of ATIP, the government agency, which really didn't have a lot to do with To the Stars. But the To the Stars people, of course, were very ha helpful to us. Um, so they, you know, it, it wasn't that really the focus of the story was about the government program, how it got started, how it was funded, uh, how many years it went, what did it do, who ran it, things like that. It was just to establish the existence of the program, basically. I see. And um, and so it just basically gained, gained momentum. And then you, you, was it you who actually went to the New York Times to see if they would? Yeah, I mean, what actually happened was after that meeting, I was, I was absolutely blown away by that meeting, first of all, because of what I was shown there. Um, I mean, I, nobody at that point knew that this program existed. And I was shown documentation uh, about it. And I was shown information about how it got set up, uh, inf documents about, uh, I was shown the letter that Lou Elizondo wrote to, to Secretary Mattis when he resigned. It was actually the very day that he resigned was the day I met him. Hmm. And all this documentation I, I, um, that has since kind of come out in bits and pieces, I think George Knapp has released a lot of it, but... Um, I was shown a lot of stuff from uh, Lou Elizondo documenting who he was within the Pentagon and what his job was and his job performance ratings and a whole lot of stuff. Plus, I got to talk to him for a couple of hours. 
and just connect and hear about him and hear about what was going on there. And then I was also shown these three videos and I was shown documentation to uh, prove that they were actual Department of Defense videos and that they'd been cleared for release by the department. So it was enough for me to realize that this was a potential story for the New York Times because of all the documentation and because pe these people, Lou was willing to go on the record with this. So, th so the next step was I, I went to my colleague, Ralph Blumenthal, who had worked at the Times for a long time. I used to be on staff full time and he was now a freelancer. At that point, I wasn't even a freelancer for the Times. I am now, but I, I brought the story to Ralph. We talked about it and... Um, he came down and we met again with, with Lou and I introduced Ralph to him and we met with Lou in Philadelphia and uh, had a long meeting with, with him and Ralph where Ralph got to see all the things I saw and he got to talk to Lou. Uh, and then Ralph went and pitched the story to an editor at the New York Times that he knew. And it was just this whole process of it going from one person to another. He pitched the story and then we made, he and I both met with uh, Mark Mazzetti, who's the director of in investigations and the Bureau, the Times Bureau in Washington, D.C., a very, very high level person at the New York Times. He happened to be in New York. So we sat down with him. And at this point, I had collected a lot of these documents and we laid them out on the table because they've been provided to me, laid them out on the table for him, showed him what we had, said, here is the story told him the story that this program actually exists and we can document that. People are all willing to go on the record, all the things he needed to hear. And he said, okay, I'm going to take it back to the to the, the Washington Bureau and I'll get back to you and let you know. And we heard about a week later that they, they green-lighted the article and that they were going to assign Helene Cooper to work with us. And so that's how it all got in play. It all took a while. Yeah. And then, you know, then once it's in play, then we have to do the work of actually putting the story together. And that was a process that took a lot of time and energy. And there's very tight editing and, and that goes on at the Times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was used to writing for the Huffington Post where I could literally say anything I wanted. <laughs> and for the New York Times, everything is vetted very, very closely. Uh, you, you know, things you think are important are taken out and things you don't want in or put it put in and you know, there's a lot of people involved, and and you it it eventually gets whittled down to what t is probably the best story it can be because of all of that process that goes on. But mm. it's a long process. It's a long process. When you say a long process, um, about how long? Well, I would say it probably took about two months because by the time wow. we got the the green light, it must have been November. Yeah, yeah maybe it, I'd say about two months. I mean, because Ralph and I were already doing a lot of work before we even got the green light. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when it started. But I think we, I, I don't remember, the, maybe towards the end of October is when we really went full full blast for the New York Times. And then it came out towards the end of December. So, And we worked really hard on it full time, three people. So it just, I don't think people understand how time consuming it is because they just read an article and it's sure. not like we just sit down and wrote it you know yeah <laughs> there's such a process that goes on and so many interviews that you do and a lot of them you never even use and nobody knows about all you do that doesn't get used wow but and you do a lot of stuff on background with people off the record who won't even have won't even be part of the story and it's just um a lot that goes on in putting a story together like that. Well, and then we did the yeah. second bit about Dave Fravor, too. And that was another another oh, yeah. component, you know, the Nimitz case. And we, we also, uh, I met, I went down to Washington and met with Helene Cooper and met him in person. The three of us had dinner together. And, um, you know, we also put together that story. So it was almost like a second story in a way that came out at the same time. Wow. Yeah, so much goes into it behind the scenes. And, um I, I believe Randall Nickerson uh, is listening to the show tonight, and um, he has told me, you know, he talk, I'm just talking about the amount of time. I forget how many hours he said that he had that he whittled through, but it was it was in the hundreds of hours of film that he whittled down to make his film, uh, the phenom uh, the uh, phenomena. No, no way. The aerial phenomenon. Aerial phenomenon. Aerial phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, two yeah. great movies coming out this year. Um, yeah. The aerial That's phenomenon right. and the phenomenon. That's um, right. I yeah. think they're both going to be great. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, but the, the amount of hours, a lot of people never understand. They, we always see the finished product and we just kind of assume 
oh yeah, they you know they put this together. It's probably any front page article in the New York Times is going to have that type of scrutiny, especially on a topic like this. Uh, do you think it? Yeah, had... it has a lot of scrutiny, but not this not a hundred worth equivalent of a hundred hours of footage. I have to say that's <laughs> that's going to take a lot longer to go through. Yeah. than what we did. Do you think? Let me just ask you this: Do you think this article in particular had more scrutiny than most articles? I don't know. That's a good question, Martin. I mean, I'm assuming it probably had quite a bit of scrutiny because of the topic. So maybe it did have more. And also the fact that, you know, Ralph and I are not regular writers for the Times. So they had to sort of oversee what we were doing. Certainly Helene Cooper is. But um, I suspect it probably had more than the average article. But, you know, I don't know about, but, you know, some of the, the, the journalists who write for the paper almost every day, and, you know, I doubt that those articles require the kind of editorial oversight that ours did. Now, so um, there oftentimes there's, as you know yourself, there's a pushback. Oh, by the way, um, if you if you search on Google, anyone out there, if you search on Go Google a um, uh, book like you're looking for a book about UFOs, um, you're probably aware of this, aware of this, that your book comes up the first on Google. Uh, well, I'm glad because I wasn't aware of that because I've never searched that before. So well, I have as, never searched book UFOs. Yeah. As someone who I, I like to, you know, I'd like to get new guests on this show all the time. And a lot of times uh, there'll be someone new that's never written about UFOs and they'll write a book and I'll try to get them on. I actually have someone coming up. I can't read. Uh, Dave Halpern, I think it is, might be. Um, but mm -hmm. um, so what I do is I go on Google and I just do book UFOs. And then I go into Amazon from there and try to look at the most recent books. And I'm giving all my podcasts, uh, people out there that do podcasts, a little tip on how to get guests. But um, a lot of people, want, to, of course, want to talk about their new book. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, yours comes up number one. Um, and I would say, uh, I, always, I always mess up the title. Can you tell me the title of that? Sure. It's UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. That's right. Um, that is just that's one of the first books I read and a very, very good book. It's still available as far as I know. Right. It's still available. Yeah. It's it's amazing how you, I mean, it's still getting a lot of play. And, you know, as you say, a lot of people are still buying that book, even though it came out in 2010. But it's kind of a timeless book. So and yes. it, it has it keeps getting exposure through various I don't know what uh, television shows or interviews or whatever. Um yeah. And then, of course, when this New York Times story came out, it did it got exposure, and then I did media interviews where it got exposure. So, it's um it's still very much alive out there. Yeah, yeah, it's a great one. Uh, we're about uh, we might as well take it into the break because we're um at about that time right now. So we're going to head into a break, and we'll be back. And when we do come back, um, we're going to talk for about another oh I don't know half hour or so. And then we'll take calls. And so if you want to write that number down, that's, uh, oops, I don't have it up in front of me, 857-472-5483. Uh, uh, that's what I'm thinking. But hang on just a second. Let me get that number up. I'll do that again. If you want to call, um, that number is 855-472. Uh, I think I did have that backwards. 855-472-5483. That's going to be in the half hour um, after we, we uh, come back. So again, hang in, everyone. We'll be right back right after these messages. All right, everyone. Welcome back. My guest now is uh, Leslie Kane. And uh, when we went off the air, we were talking um, about, you know, the different articles. Um, and the second article I want to talk a little more about, um, you mentioned, uh, Leslie, that you met up with David Fravor. And uh, I consider, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of um, a lot of uh, shows where he's talking, you know, about this situation, and it really is amazing. Um, how is he in person to talk to? Oh, he was fantastic. I mean, very uh, energetic and very talkative. We mm -hmm. had a long, Helene Cooper and I had a long meeting with him, and we went over the whole case and. He was absolutely an enjoyable, lively, enthusiastic, and very smart person. We enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, well, they're, they're, you know, I mean, a fighter pilot, someone like him, and then he was not only that, he was a lead or something. I don't know what the terms are 
uh, exactly, and I apologize if I'm offending anyone because I don't know what those terms are, but he wasn't just a fighter pilot. He was a head of mm, head the squadron. Head of the squadron, or, yeah, very yeah. highly trained, very highly skilled person. I mean, that's true. He wasn't yeah. just your average pilot. And, uh, and even the average fighter pilot is, you know, uh, quite a superhuman to begin with. Exactly. They're not going to exactly. put someone in a, a whatever millions of dollar uh, piece of equipment um, that isn't, you know, highly skilled and highly intelligent and all and all that. Yeah, I mean, he was a commander at the time. Oh, that's right. Uh, but I don't yeah. know if that mean. I don't know exactly what that means. I'm I'm not. I'm excuse, I'm sorry. I don't know more oh, about right what exactly you. his his <laughs> role was. But he, uh, I know he was very at a high level within the within the navy. And I heard him on a, it was a great um, podcast that a, um, someone that just did, was a fighter pilot himself. And he actually had him, I actually had him on the show um, to mm -hmm. talk about it. But I heard, you know, a skeptic interview him and just, you know, it was really a good show to listen to because, you know, he's talking straight talk um, with them, with him. And, you know, he's just said, well, I just can't, can't tell you what it was, but I'll tell you what I saw it do. And. And uh, that whole whole situation is is really um, that that kind of snowballed, um, didn't it? That whole thing. Yeah, I mean, he uh, he he was so sought after by the media. Yes. You know, incredibly in the weeks after the story came out, but but even ever since, I mean, he's been on, and he didn't shy away from media, so he did a lot of it. And I think he might have even gone to some conferences. I have no idea. But he's he did, definitely yeah. been very much out in the public arena. And uh, that was his choice to do that. And that's what he did. Um, you know, it, and someone of his level, you know, I mean, it, you wonder how much grief. I know he got grief right away. Um, like the next day, they were actually teasing him. They put like a cartoon in the, the paper that they uh, published there on the, on the uh, not the Princeton. Uh, was it the Princeton? Yeah, the Princeton, or yeah, the, or the yeah. Nimitz, or wherever, whichever one he was on, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And so he, he did. He did get some grief uh, from that, but I'm I'm really glad that he did choose to actually uh, talk about it, and um, you know, it it just really helped push that along. And uh, I agree, he was absolutely really really important in all of this. I absolutely agree with you. Now I know that uh, when once your article came out. All of a sudden, there was a deluge of news stories on all the networks. Did you ever count how many stories came out after that? I didn't, Martin, but there is a, there's a, a, a guy named um, Guillermo. You know the guy yes, I mean? Yes, I, I believe I sent you that link uh, to, when, that ha when, I, when that came out. At, at that yeah, time, well, he it was put... 121 or something like that. And he still has a website, I believe. He built a website just dedicated to all the stuff that came as a result of the New York Times story. Everything he put up there, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I have that link. Actually, if people go to my website, I have that link on my website, which I think is still there. And I think he even still adds to it. Like, we recently had this... Uh, Funny, funny thing that happened on this uh, television show called NCIS, oh, which yes. I sent you the link to, Martin. Now he was the one that alerted me about that, and he's gonna—I'm sure he's gonna add that to the list. Oh my God! Let, let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, he's monitoring these things. Yeah. So just if people want to see everything in, at once, and, and they're all linked, uh, they can. They, if you go to the UFO section of my website, um, it's the link is there in the in the media section. So. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how much was generated as a result of that story. Right, and so let's let's talk about. You did send me the link earlier. <laughs> um, NCIS. What's it called? I think it's called NCIS. I, I sort of I never watch TV, so yeah, same here. Of that type, yeah. you know, I vaguely heard of this show, but I knew absolutely nothing about it. And uh, he sent me the link to this little preview, which showed. These guys walking into this office and there's this woman there and they said, what is it in here? And she goes, it's the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. <laughs> and then she has this whole thing about, here's what we do here. And then and then they show a video that looks very similar to the one in the Times, the famous one. Yes. Uh, 
but they changed it just enough. I think it was the Nimitz one. It was an imitation of that one. They changed it just enough so that they couldn't be accused of like using that one, actually. <laughs> oh, it was so funny. And the whole story was about these Chinese operatives who were trying to infiltrate the program. And then they, it turns out the woman running it was colluding with them to try to get information. And there was a guy who was pretending he was an abductee. It was just this whole craziness. But it was just interesting that a tip was in that show that it's it's so much part of the culture now that it would be make it you know it would be part of a show like that i thought that was pretty amusing but it was really a really bad the whole thing <laughs> it was fun to watch though. i think that what yeah. the, what um the comment i made back to you when i watched the clips is that it's a little tiny bit of truth mixed in with a whole bunch of um so-called entertainment or or um sort of trying to make an X-Files type of uh, situation out of just a little tiny bit of truth. Yeah, I would agree with you because I think, I mean, they did describe what the program does, which is pretty accurate. And um, the fact that the Chinese were the ones trying to get the information is kind of interesting because certainly there are, you know, one of the reasons for the secrecy in the program and for protecting information and having things classified is, is so that other countries like China and Russia don't get their hands on our data. And so I found it sort of intriguing that, you know, because we know that the Chinese, sometimes there are spies that come around and try to infiltrate labs and get information and get it back to the government. So that that component of it was sort of interesting that that's what they choose to focus on. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. But the way, it, but everything about the plot and how it was, the things that happened in the show were, were pretty ludicrous. <laughs> they really were. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I didn't catch the show itself, YouTube. but just People the clips. People can probably watch it. I think you can probably watch it somewhere yeah. on some ways. <laughs> it was just on about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know. Uh, you know, when you and I briefly spoke uh, ahead of the show, um, you said that you're you haven't really like uh, glued yourself to the UFO topic lately because you're writing a book, um, and well. No, I don't. I didn't say I was writing a book, but I have. I have another project I'm involved with, but it's not writing oh, a book. A uh, project, I meant. I'm sorry, you did say the yeah, word yeah. project. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, um, but let's just before we move on from this topic, uh, after that, um, after that article did come out, uh, were you also sought for? Uh, I know you said you didn't. You know, at the time you said you know you didn't want to come on the show right away, um, but were were people after you all, all the time to talk to them? Yes, absolutely. And at that point, when the article first came out, we had uh, to run every request we got through the public relations department of the New York Times ah. as as reporters on the story f for them as something this sensitive. It's not like I could just go run around and do every UFO podcast that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they were we were trying to be very careful about that. And we had to get their permission for everything. So... That's why we kind of focused on the, the major media. And yep. anyway, it wasn't completely in, up to me. Let's put it that way. Isn't that something? So they're so cautious about an article like that, that they want to um, they want to follow up afterwards to make sure that things don't go astray or something. Yeah, or something. I don't, quite, I don't quite. Yeah, they don't. They want to make sure that they're not somehow discredited and that I mean, um, I, I don't know exactly. I just think that's how they do it in general. I mean, that's their, for any story that gets a lot of attention, I think the the media department or the public relations department always handles any requests for interviews by the writers. Um, and it's just the way they do it at the times. So I don't know if it was just because it was about UFOs, but, um, and there were way more requests than I could handle anyway. Helene didn't really want to do them. And Ralph did some, but he was also not as interested. You know, he's, he doesn't particularly like to do media either. And there was just so much that there's only so much we could do at the time. Let's put it that way. I remember I did have a conversation with Helene through um, through email. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I just I just asked her, uh, you know, basically the same time I asked you at the time, I'm having no idea at all about this, um, what you're talking about, um, that it had to go through the New York Times um, department before anyone could do any interview. But she... Uh, right away said oh contact my co-authors 
And she yeah, she name. didn't. Yeah. She didn't really want to be the one out there, and yeah. also she didn't really consider herself as somebody that knowledgeable about UFOs in general. Yeah, you know, she was certainly knowledgeable about what we covered in the story, but she didn't have the background that Ralph and I had in the topic in general. So that was, you know, she just had to move on to her next assignment, basically. Sure. Sure. Uh, this was not like the big focus of her life for her, like it like it was for me and and to some extent to Ralph too. Right. Now, do you happen to know? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of times there's ridicule about this topic. Do you know if the New York Times itself had any flack, or any feedback from um, you know longtime um, subscribers to their paper, et cetera? Oh, I don't think anything negative, Martin. I mean, the response was so astronomical. The numbers of hits that it got, it was the number one story for days following the release of the really? story. I mean, it was, oh yeah, it was the biggest story in that paper for quite a few days. The videos were the most watched videos for, I don't know how long, five days a week or something like that. I mean, it was, you know, it just was, so I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe if I read every single comment on every board someplace, there were people that thought it was ridiculous, probably. But I think that the response was generally overwhelmingly positive, and people were fascinated, and they wanted more. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I have heard I heard from people that, you know, don't even follow this topic, or, you know, even I remember when it first came out, I didn't even know about it, and my son told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the person. Those are the people we were hoping to reach. We don't need to reach the people that in the UFO community who already know this all, or they don't know about the ATIP program. But you know what I'm saying. We need to. My goal has always been to take this issue into the mainstream and into the and so to the attention of policymakers and people who are in a position to really change things. Um, and that's what I think we were able to accomplish here. Okay. Um, one of the the questions I have is. Um, the you mentioned that um, they had permission to release the films, and there's been so much controversy about that. Did you, have you followed any, any of that controversy, whether they actually had permission to let those films out there? Um, I don't jump into it too much, Martin. Yeah. I was kind of aware that there were some questions about it, but I, you know, we stand by what we wrote. I have the documents that show the validity I, you know i have what i need and yeah. what we needed at the times to know that what we reported was true so yeah i don't have the time to spend a lot of time reading about people who are questioning things that uh, you know i know are true so i don't know well i guess i'll, I'll put uh, it this way i w you know part of it may have been that the document wasn't released and i think it may have gotten released later but at the time, oh. we, we, you know, the Times doesn't go about releasing confidential documents that are given to us by confidential sources. We just don't have that option. Uh, okay. And certainly at that time, we did not have permission to release any of these documents. Sure. So that, you know, that can create a problem because people want to see, uh, le legitimately so, they want to see the proof um, yeah. of whatever we're talking about. But I can assure the audience that the New York Times is not going to print something about a ufo video unless they've seen the document that shows that what we're saying is accurate yeah and and they also trusted lou elizondo as a source the combination of those two things yeah yeah that that's basically i guess what my question was was uh, if if the new york times was satisfied with the document then um there shouldn't be i mean as as stringent as they are there shouldn't be any question on on that really i would think i mean they're just they I mean, want it, it's up to, you know, if people want to raise questions, I, I don't know. And maybe they have legitimate questions. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. I can tell you that we stand by what we wrote in the in the, in the Times. Yeah. Um, um, there's been a lot of talk um, over these last few years that there's still another film that may uh, come out. Have you heard anything about that at all? Uh, I've just heard from people. Uh, you know, people connected with to the stars and from Lou that there a lot more videos exist. Mm -hmm. But I also have been told that it's extremely hard to get them released, especially yeah. now. Um, mm -hmm. Now that he's not involved with the program anymore, he's outside the Pentagon. Um, so I have no doubt that they exist. I think a lot right. of them are probably classified. In fact, I know that they are. But I know that there are 
certainly people connected with the ATIP program, such as the people at To The Stars and others who would like nothing more than to get those videos released. So, But it's extremely difficult, and I don't think it's going to happen in the near future, from what I know, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I, there may be people that know. I'm sure there are people that know more about that than I do. Um, but that's my sense of it, is that, you know, I wouldn't hold your breath on getting more videos to come out. Right. Unfortunately. I spoke with uh, Stan Friedman right after um, that happened. As a matter of fact, that's my number one um, uh, video on my YouTube channel is when I spoke to Stan Friedman right after Mm -hmm. this article came out. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think it was the following week. And uh, that has over 100,000 views on on YouTube. But anyway, um, the one question or the I thought his response was was uh, pretty interesting. He said, why now? Why would the government agree to let this information out now? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, by let this information out, does he mean the whole story that Elizondo brought forward? Or does he mean specifically the videos? Or I think the whole story, basically. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think there was any kind of, you know deep hidden reason for why now because people ask that question a lot uh, the, the reason it happened when it did is because that's when Lou Elizondo decided to resign and he resigned at that point you know in October because he was fed up as he wrote in his letter to General Mattis Secretary General Mattis Secretary of Defense he just got s- to the point of such exasperation with uh, the lack of resources that were being provided, the fact that this topic wasn't being taken seriously, that he felt that this was a national security issue that needed attention. And he had just been, uh, his frustration had built up and built up. He was planning to retire anyway, but he retired early. So as far as I'm concerned, it was his walking out of that job that precipitated the story. Hmm. And why he chose to do it at that particular time, uh, as far as I understand it, he was planning to retire anyway in maybe about six months later. He retired earlier because he was interested in working with Two the Stars, and it was sort of a, an umbrella that, for him to move into, and it was the timing felt right to him to do it then. Would, so I, um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure there is any hidden, deep hidden reason, reason you know, the, of anybody else that was controlling the situation other than this is just his choice to do what he did at that particular moment. Now, I wonder if things were different and there was no To The Stars Academy out there. Um, what, you know, he may have retired a little bit later. Do you th- I mean, I would like to have the conversation with him actually and ask him, you know, what would he have done? Uh, would he still wanted, you know, if he wanted to get the word out there, um, you know, where would he have gone if he didn't have that, uh, as you said, umbrella to, to switch over to? Yeah, I just don't know. You could ask him. Yeah. I mean, he certainly knew the individuals who, who invited me to that meeting initially were people, two of them were people I'd known for a long time. And I suspect that even if To The Stars hadn't been uh, set up, those two people were still involved with him and with that and with the program. Hmm. So the same, theoretically, the same thing could have happened even without to the stars. It was really just a matter of what he, what he chose to do. Hmm. If he retired six months later, maybe he would have still, even without to the stars, theoretically, he probably could have still brought the story out because of other people the same way through people that I knew that he knew. Um, but you know, who knows? It's all speculation and you could ask him about it. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, so that's my sense of it. It it was his retiring that precipitated the whole thing. I see. Yeah. Um, it's funny when I met him in, um, Cherry Hill, uh, we hung out for, I don't know, maybe a half hour. We never once mentioned the word UFO. (laughs) No, that's good. He probably, probably really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. We were, he was, he's a collector of, uh, of yeah. certain things and we we talked all about all about that stuff instead so a uh, real i really a very likable guy and uh, uh yeah uh, someone you know when he's talking to you directly um he's very believable and and uh you just i i never got any sense of uh any any type of uh, deception from uh lou ever so far you know i mean it's just not him so uh, i'm really grateful uh, for what he's done. And I mentioned earlier, um, we have uh, 
there's a graphic. I'll pull it up again for if someone's just joining us um, that uh, was on a third grade uh, classroom uh, remote uh, teaching class, a learning class um, from a third grader and uh, do UFOs, you know, basically about UFOs and uh, let's see, do aliens exist? I think that's the title of it. And it goes into UFO sightings all the way back to Kenneth Arnold. And then it goes um, that the U.S. government has looked into this and it brings up Lou, Louis Elizondo and uh, talks all about him, uh, about the UFO sightings. And uh, very interesting. Uh, that, that's I mean, that, great. That's yeah. another thing that probably wouldn't have happened if your article never came out. <laughs> Maybe not. I just wish they wouldn't keep mixing it up with the, with aliens. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> um, Especially with third graders. You know, yes. that's not a good thing to tell a third, to, to deal with when you're in third grade. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It, you know, I looked at that briefly. I skimmed it over. And that's the title, Do Aliens Exist? And then it talks about, um, you know, UFOs. And uh, basically the little girl told um, her mom, uh, who's that my friend um, she said you know there's a lot of evidence that these things really are there mom <laughs> that's good the ufos are there but yeah. aliens is a whole other thing yeah you know yeah uh, and i just always try to keep the two questions separate but it's hard to do it in this culture yeah yeah um i know there's you know it, it it's one of the many possibilities and and that's you know as i do the show um, I still don't know. I still don't have any real idea. You know, I think we, uh, we, I should say, I think a lot of us may, um, you know, think that's a possibility, uh, very much a possibility just because of the strangeness of it all. Um, for instance, you know, the technologies that are observed that are just so far beyond anything we could imagine could be created, you know, by us. So mm-hmm. that's, that's, I think that's, you know, understandable why a lot of people are thinking that's what it it must be absolutely oh yeah it's just something about the word i mean i would think of it as maybe uh some kind of interdimensional or extraterrestrial phenomenon that's way more complicated than just thinking about alien creatures coming here from another planet Mm -hmm. you know i just think it kind of oversimplifies it and that the word alien is just not one that i particularly like but that's just me yeah i know it's you know that's just me yeah, well, um, I do think, um, you know, the odds are, as um, I think I have a couple of scientists coming on, that we're going to discuss this type of thing. And one of them is, uh, you know, the possibility of, of alien life out there, which is, you know, tremendous, in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, it, would, it would be such a, a shame if, uh, if there wasn't intelligent life out there. Yeah, with, with yeah. With all, the, all the, the potential. I think I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start phone calls early, so... Um, just a few minutes early. And so that number, if anyone wants to call in, um, is going to be up on your screen here in just a second. That number is uh, 855-472-5483. And um, just uh, we want, we want uh, topics uh, related to uh, what Leslie was involved in uh, for the call, or uh, we already have a caller, it looks like, coming in. Just change something here. Um, so that number is uh, 855-472-5483. Here we go. Okay. And so we have uh, Steve uh, calling in from Las Vegas. So I'm going to bring him on right now. Hi, Leslie. Uh, hi. hi, Steve. Uh, hi, how you doing, yeah. Steve? Great. Um, I'm one of the callers that uh, asked Martin, please get Leslie, please get Leslie Keen uh, as a guest. Um, oh, thank so you not, for that. I'm glad to be on. And speaking to you, I've been following your work for many years, your insight on um, the Kecksburg case, the uh, Chicago Air Airport case, and I was able to hear one of your lectures you did some years ago on uh, UFOs and the media. I have so many lists of questions, but I have broke them down to two. Okay. Uh, first question. I'm um, doing research on UFOs and the need to know. And I'm um, looking at uh, who in the intelligence community, military, or prior that are in the know that were read into the program deep with high clearance. And one name that 
popped up, and I asked Richard Dolan, and he assured me absolutely. The name, one name that came up was Dr. Hal Putoff. And uh, I'm wondering, is there anybody you think that's keeping holding back the secrets that was read deep into the program, but is holding back from us? Okay, so um, so I, I'm I'm not. I want to be Martin 100% clear that I understand the question. I understand that the, now Steve asked about Hal Putoff, and I can comment on that because I know Hal. But then, what was the question that followed that about uh, whether somebody is holding back information? Is that what you're asking, Steve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are plenty of people who know a lot, and because they have high clearances, they have access to classified information, and they absolutely cannot release that information, whether they want to or not. And um, you know, they don't have a choice about it because their their clearances provide that restriction for them. Hal Putoff is an example of somebody. He has tremendous integrity. He's absolutely brilliant. He's been, you know, he's a scientist who has been studying this topic for years, has published papers on it, and he will make public whatever he can, but there's plenty that he knows that he can't make public. And, you know, you can't hold that against people who have high-level clearances and get access to information, and they have to keep secrets because they're classified. It's just the way it works. Same with Elizondo. He never released any information that was classified. It was always, and every time I spoke to him, he was very careful to make sure that I knew and that we reporters knew that he was not revealing anything that was classified. And, and he knew plenty of things that were. Uh, again, I don't hold that against him. So, you know, there are reasons that people have to protect information. And, um, there are reasons that information is kept private or is kept secret. And certainly with a, in a place like the Department of Defense, where their job is to protect the American people, they don't want to release sensitive information that our adversaries might be able to get a hold of and, and kind of move ahead of us. So there is an issue with protecting sensitive information that they feel is in the best interest of the public, too. So I don't know if that addresses your question, Steve, but um, maybe it does. I don't know. Oh, it does. And second question. If disclosure were to happen, or these visitors made themselves present, whether a mass sighting, or maybe uh, a word event were to happen, would that make us, do you think that would make the public go into a higher consciousness to know that we are being visited if they showed themselves? Sorry for the background phone here. I, you know, it's a really, really interesting question to think about. I mean, I think it would have a lot to do with the nature of the phenomenon that did show itself to us. I'm sorry about that phone. I should have unplugged it. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it it depends. It's just so hard to predict. Uh, I think because if some, if the phenomenon made itself known, you know, what would the nature of that phenomenon be? Would it be menacing? Would it be scary? Would it be benign? Would it be spiritual? Or would it be hostile? It's just so hard to know. It certainly would change uh, consciousness, though. It would change our perception of who we are and have a dramatic effect. And one can only hope that if it happens, it would be a positive effect. But we don't really understand the nature of this phenomenon. And it might have many different components, and there might be many different elements to it. So, it, yeah. you know, we don't know what might happen. And in terms of disclosure, I mean, I, I have a little bit of trouble with that word disclosure, but if you're talking about um, an official a government saying that they have knowledge about this, um, I mean, certainly that has happened already, in my opinion, at a certain level, mm -hmm. uh, where governments have really, and certainly the New York Times article was basically saying, you know, the Pentagon's been studying this, therefore, obviously, these things exist, or they wouldn't be wasting their time for 10 years. So, uh, and that doesn't seem to have upset anybody. So I don't think official acknowledgement of, of this phenomenon is a problem for human beings. Uh, because we, I think the reality is we don't really understand what it is yet. And so, you know, it could be scary or it could have a bigger effect if we did understand more about it. And and as you said, if it or if it revealed itself to us in a way that was unmistakable, and then at that point we just would have to assess what it's 
what it was and what its intention was, and that would be the th- determining factor for how we might re- respond. So it's a really interesting question to think about. I don't think, I mean, I don't think I can really answer it, but, you know, uh, it's a very interesting thing to think about. All right. Hey, Steve, thanks for the call. Thanks, Steve. Great to hear from you. Uh, All right. Um, uh, Just before, uh, we have a a Ken from New York, but before I take him in, I just have thought, you know, wouldn't I love to get inside of Lou Alejandro's head (laughs) and know what he knows? You know, you're talking about all the classified things that he knows. That would be so so fascinating. Maybe get him drunk or something. (laughs) I know. That might be a good way. But these people, these are patriots. That's right. And they're really careful about what they say. I mean, the same is true for these people, you know, and that, you know, when people fault them for being part of some kind of cover up or something, I don't think of it that way. It's their it's their duty to protect information that they're sworn to protect. And the only reason they even have access to it is because of that commitment they have, because they have to honor their clearances and their clearances would be removed from them if they were to reveal information or so they true. could even be jailed. What do you expect, you know? Just be grateful that good people know things, even if they can't tell us about them. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you what, the lines are lit up like a Christmas tree. We have like five calls waiting. So uh, we'll start out with uh, Ken. You're on the air from New York. How are you? Hey, Martin. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Hi, Ken. A fellow New Yorker here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. How are you, uh, Leslie? How are you, Martin? Uh, I'm up. Well, I'm thanks. up. Yeah, I'm up in Washington Heights in in Manhattan, hanging in in my apartment. Okay, good, 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 good. It's getting a little bit warmer. Hopefully, we'll we'll have spring pretty soon. Um, I got about three or four questions for you, Leslie. But before I I give you these questions, I want to first thank you, Leslie, for all the hard work you've done with this New York Times article. I'm telling you, that was the article. I think what we're closest to full disclosure. That was probably the best thing that we've had happen so far in the UFO community. And I just want to say, when I saw that, I woke up that Sunday morning, okay? I could just want to say how I woke up, and I, I, I just, I don't know how I found it. I did a search on UFO, or somebody linked it to me, and I saw this article. And I'm seeing this picture on front of the New York Times. It looked like a source. And I'm like, oh, bleep. Right. Bleep. I'm like, and I'm still trembling as I'm telling you this right now. For most of us, this was it. We saw the flying saucer on the front of the Times, a big picture. We've got video. We've got a DOD, Pentagon words like that that you'd never see on the front of the Times. And it's on CNN. You've got Louis Alonso on CNN everywhere. I'm like, we all thought this was it, Leslie. And I think you might have, must have thought of it too. Everyone in the UFO thought this was it. This was the big one. Everything is coming out now. There's no stopping it. And it sort of stopped. I mean, it was the best thing we've had so far. But I'm just telling you, thank you so much for that. All the work well, you put I, in. I appreciate that. It makes all the work worth it when I hear from people like you. That's I right. love hearing the I stories bet. like that. It, it, it was a really big moment when it came out. I'll never forget it. Ken, I have to ask you this, if you would. Um, we have all the lines are full, and I don't know if pe- more people are trying to, and that's like six lines. So if you could will that down to two questions, uh, to two, the two most urgent questions okay. that you have, please. Okay. All right, well, all right. The first one, I just want to say, first, there are two, like at least two steps to this process. First, we have to figure out that, that these objects are real in these cases. Not every UFO is real. Most of them aren't. But for the ones for, that have credible um verification, like we got radar and video and testimony from, like in this Nimitz case, you know, these, they can't tell us it's just swamp gas or balloon or birds. We've whittled it down that, number one, these are real objects, okay? So they can't go back on that. So then the next step is to find out where are they coming from? Is it from earthly sources? And I've got the quote here from the recent Tim McMillan uh, Popular Mechanics um, article that says, uh, popular mechanics have since learned October 2019 staffers with the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and Senate Arms Service Committee were briefed in current UA- UAP issues, and they said, insiders said in a closed-door meeting, Senate Intelligence Brigadier General Richard Staff, director of DOD Special Access uh, Program, testified mysterious objects being encountered by the military were not related to U.S. technology. So the Pentagon is saying... Um, 
we didn't build them, Russia didn't build them, and they would seem pretty implausible that most of these countries would have gotten that far without our intelligence knowing anything about it, which leaves you with only one other, you know, possibility. So to me, that's where we're at, and that's how we have to point out this stuff to people. One, we've verified in these cases these are real unidentified objects. So now we have to eliminate, are they from Earth? Or then where else could they be from? That's right, and I, I think you've made a very good assessment of it. Um, and it's very difficult to say where they're from. You know, the big questions, where they're from, who is who is behind them, who's driving them, or who's manipulating them, and why are they here? And we don't have the answers to those questions, but yeah, that's what everybody wants to know. And I, I think, you know, the ATIP program, what they were doing was gathering as much data as they possibly could on the objects. And, you know, when I talked to Elizondo, he said they didn't really expect to find answers to those questions. What they wanted to do was find out as much as they possibly could about how the objects did what they do. So how they could explain the way they behaved. And they were interested in the technology and how it worked. And they learned a great deal about that. But I think the questions that you're raising are the key questions. I don't think we have answers to them yet. And I hope we get them. And next that, quick one, please, Ken. Yeah, that's what I just wanted to reiterate. That article points out that they have people who are getting statements from people behind the scenes saying, we, they're not ours. This is what right. the confirmation we have. To Those are really important statements, and it's incredible. When you think back, you know, five, ten years ago, you never would have expected statements like that. So yeah, we're making progress. Yeah, that's who it's a brigadier general. So now we've got the two steps. First, with the real, we have verification that these are real objects, and we got verification from high-ranking people saying it's not from these any earthly sources, including Louis Alonso. So we just got to, you know, well, what else could it be if it's not from here? Where right. Well, you know, some people say, well, maybe it is some secret technology or, you know, and and what is it? I mean, it's even if it's not from here, we don't know what it is. Yeah. Is Ken, it, yeah. Is Ken, it I'm, I'm you know, sorry. a craft from another planet? Is it interdimensional? Is it who yeah. knows? You know, there's still so many unanswered questions. Ken, we have a lot of people waiting for I'm going to have to move on. But thank you so much for your call. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Keep up the great work, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Good night. All right. All right. Next, we have uh, John. John's calling from California. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Martin. Uh, hi, Leslie. How are you? Hi, John. Good to hear from you. Same to you. I uh, uh, really uh, like the fact that uh, both you and Martin bring such respectability to this subject, and uh, your book, was phenomenal. I read it years ago, and it was ahead of its time. And the cases that you studied and investigated and, and wrote about were probably uh, the best uh, cases uh, for somebody believing in, in UFOs or UAPs, whatever you want to call them. But, but my question is this. Lou Elizondo kind of admitted on Tucker Carlson's uh, Fox show that there has been uh, metamaterials or possibly crashed retrievals. Uh, how do you feel about that? And has your investigation led to, I know a lot of that stuff is classified, but have you, do you have an opinion on that? Do you think that we actually have recovered uh, craft uh, or pieces of a craft? Uh, do you have any inv investigations into that subject? Yeah, I mean, you're right that it's very difficult to investigate because it's so highly classified, all of that stuff. But I have no doubt that certainly materials do exist. Um, and there's, you know, I know that from sources. I know that from Elizondo. I know that from uh, a book written by Diana Pasolka called American Cosmic, in which, uh, which I recommend to everybody, in which she talks about uh, materials that have been, re been recovered. And she was involved directly with some of the people who have those materials. So I don't think there's any doubt that they exist. Crash retrievals, I suspect there probably are crash retrievals. I mean, and I'm sure there are many people out there who who feel they, they know that there are. Um, so, you know, uh, but I don't have proof at the level that I would need in order to be able to like do a story about that for the New York Times. And the re and, and you know, I was hoping after our first story that writing about the materials would kind of be the next door that would open. Hmm. That was what all of us were hoping at wow. the, my, my Ralph Blumenthal and I, but it just didn't happen because ev we found out how 
classified it all is. We can't find out who has them, where they are, what what are they. Uh, there are some that are in the possession of scientists who are doing very good work on them, but these scientists legitimately don't want to release information on them until they finish their examinations of the materials and until they've published articles on them in peer-reviewed journals, which is what scientists want to do. They don't want to tell you about an investigation when it's only halfway there. So, right. um, so anyway, I think there's a lot of interesting work being done. I, I have no doubt that the materials exist. Uh, whether we will ever get proof that any of them are indeed not manu couldn't possibly have been manufactured on Earth, I don't know. I hope we do. Uh, and obviously, that's what everybody's looking for. Um, but there are also, there's a lot of classified uh, walls that you bump up against trying to find out about them. So that's 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 Thank what that's, yeah that's where it stands for me. That's interesting to hear you uh, say that. I'm I'm uh, I always uh, respect what you say because of the the hard work you do. Well, Both thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of sources have have described them, and I think people have done so publicly. I mean, I don't think it's that big a secret anymore that there are materials out there that are being studied, whether any have been proven to be, you know, not manufactured on Earth. That's another question. But there are certainly pieces right. of interest that are under investigation. And then my, my, I'll just be real quick. My my last question. I'm sure you've been asked this tons of times, but do you have an opinion on people like? Um, uh, Rick Doty or uh, Bob Lazar, do you think uh, some of the stuff they're saying is true? Uh, m m most of it is true or hardly any of it is true? Do you have any? Uh, any you know what? I just don't like to comment on on people, other people. I mean, I I just would prefer not to comment. I don't feel in a position to really make an, a, a, a comment, you know, a really sure. valid comment about uh, these gentlemen either. And I, I, you know, I find Bob Lazar's work fascinating, and I, I have great respect for George Knapp, but I'm not an expert on on him at all. So, I think I, should, I think I just would prefer not to comment. Sure, I understand that, and I hope you're safe back in New York. And uh, once again, thanks so much for the uh, for the information. Thank you, Martin. All right, thanks, John. John. Hey, thanks for the good question. I really appreciate it. It was good. Thank you. Hey, take care. Bye, Mike. Yeah. All right. So moving on, we have uh, Mike. And Mike is calling from Montana. Welcome to the show, Mike. Hey, thanks, Martin. How you doing? Good. How are you? You have a question for our guest? Uh, more of a comment, I guess. But um, I just, as as with many of the other callers, I uh, just want to say thanks for um, everything you've done. Um, I I'd been working Thank on you. a book about UFOs since 2012, and it uh. It sort of looked at it in the context of time travel and human evolution. Um, and before that article came out, I was kind of crapping my pants about what the reaction was going to be. I'm a professor up in, in Montana, and uh, I've got tenure, and uh, I'm a full professor now, so it's not like I had to worry about getting fired. But I was extremely concerned about what the reaction would be, and, and that article in 2017 definitely... Uh, opened up a lot of opportunities for researchers and academics to be able to look at things in real terms and to talk about them more openly. So That's great. Well, yeah, and speaking of academics, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Jeff Kripal from Rice University, who's an academic who's very involved with this. And and another one is, is uh, Diana Pasolko, who wrote the book American Cosmic. Um, I don't know what department you're in, Mike, or what your area of specialty is, but they, they're both people that are they're in the religious religion departments of their their universities, but they're very uh, they're they're absolute academics, you know, highly credentialed, but they're very interested in this topic, and they are also working on trying to get the academic community to open up to it more. So you might enjoy looking them up and looking yep. at some of their work if you haven't already. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm a I'm a biological anthropologist and look at it in the context of long term evolutionary changes. And uh, yeah, I've actually been on the show before. Martin and I spoke about this and I won't won't take up your time. I know you guys. That's got fascinating. It. Fascinating. That's all I can say. I hope well, you keep doing it. Yeah. Plan on it. Thanks, guys. All right, Mike. Thanks. Thanks for the call. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, Bruce. Bruce is calling from New Jersey. Welcome to the show, Bruce. Hey, hi, Martin. How are you doing? All right. How are you? I'm okay. Uh, and Leslie, how, how are you doing? 
I'm doing okay, Bruce. How are Good. you? Um, I'm okay, uh, considering. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a couple things. I I, uh, I have a connection to both of you uh, offhand way. Martin, you uh, played my music on your show uh, a number of times in the past. I want to thank you for that. Um, I, I don't know if you remember that. It was uh, maybe three or four years ago. I do. Yes, yes, I do. Yes. I have that somewhere, I do believe. I know I ha a computer, I had that stuff on fried, but I do believe I still... Uh, just tell me the title of... of do you know the, remember the title? Uh, one the was title? called If... Uh, yes, uh, I do have that. I have that, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for playing my music on your show. Sure. I make sure for me. Uh, and then, Leslie, um, I uh, actually went to college with your brother. Uh, oh, you back did? Back in college. Which yeah, brother? Uh, uh, Gary. Oh, really? At Ripon or, or where? Uh, Antioch. Oh, Antioch. Okay. That's incredible. I can't believe it. <laughs> and he, he and I used to sit around a lot and talk about UFOs and other philosophical things. And um, I, I lived at his house. He lived in a house outside of town. I lived in right. his house a little while. And we, we just talked about it a lot. And one time I think you called and he was talking to you while I was there. And afterwards I said, well, uh, what, what's your sister do? And I think it was when you were working at Democracy Now!, was it? Oh, yeah, uh, our KPFA radio in, in Berkeley, California. I think it's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, similar to Democracy Now!, a show very similar to that. Right, right. Uh, it was... Uh, Unfortunately, we weren't able to get it at Antioch, but uh, there were a lot of things happening in Yellow Springs um, because of its proximity to uh, um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Hmm. Uh, jets used to fly over Yellow Springs all the time, and they'd fly really low. And all the students would say, oh, that's, they're spying on us, all this stuff, which I don't know if that was true, but... Uh, uh, years later, I was working at the radio station, and a fellow DJ there lived in a house in town um, where the guy who owned the house was a scientist who worked at Wright Patterson. And I used to ask him all the time, well, "What's he do?" You know, there was all these rumors about Hangar 18, and you know, I, I don't know. If, I, I'm an open-minded skeptic. I don't believe a lot of the stories, but. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. He's a scientist. And one day I was out on the lawn and um, I s heard this noise in the, in the sky. It was a, uh, sounded like an air, uh, a prop airplane turning off its motor. So I looked up and I saw this strange looking craft. It had to, uh, this predates, I guess, the um, uh, stealth bomber. But it kind of looked like that. It was uh, uh, I, years later. I saw pictures of the Horton brother aircraft mm -hmm. that, um, that they were working on during World War II, and it looked very similar to that. And I thought, well, you know, maybe they are doing you know all this um, back engineering and stuff. Uh, but I, I always wondered why none of the UFO um, investigators didn't go to uh, Yellow Springs. I mean, this guy who was a scientist there, everybody knew he worked at Mike Patterson, and to me it would have been a logical uh, way to get try to get um, a, a new story. Because uh, Yellow Springs, I, I think there were several other um, scientists who lived in the area. Uh, it was always being inundated with um, Mike Patterson aircraft flying over, and really low. Uh, so I'm assuming that these scientists would tell these people, fly over Yellow Springs, I'll go outside and, and examine what you're doing. Huh. Um, so I thought that was yeah. kind of and I have no idea. I just couldn't, I couldn't even comment. I have no idea what the deal was there or why there weren't people out there. Maybe Bruce? there were. Hey, well, Bruce, I, uh, we're running out of time. I'm going to have to catch these other calls, but good to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't always listen to the live show, but I listen later on. Yeah. It uh, helps me go to sleep. So. <laughs> You're not the only one that tells me that. All right. Okay, Bruce. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, bye. Uh, 
All right. Uh, next, we have uh, Stephen. Uh, we just have uh, Stephen from Washington. Uh, is that Washington State, Stephen? It is. Yeah. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes. I'm trying to get. We have one more caller after you. I. Uh, so. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Go I'll right ahead. Really, yeah. I just have one question for Leslie, and that's um, numerous Pentagon spokesmen have come out. Um, spokespeople have come out and said that. Uh, Luis Elizondo never had any official duties with ATIP at all. Um, Christopher Sherwood and Susan Goff have both said that from the Pentagon. And I'm just, how confident are you that Luis Elizondo really headed that ATIP program like he claims? And that's my question. I'll jump offline. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, the word head, I mean, I think part of the issue, you know, I mean, we stand by everything he wrote in the Times and that Lou was the sort of person, the focal point, the folk pers- focal person for that entity called ATIP. But I think part of the problem is that ATIP didn't really have a formal existence. I mean, it, it didn't have its own office. It, you know, they just called themselves that. It was a kind of a loose affiliation almost. And mm. so it's not something that, a PR person speaking out in behalf of the Defense Department would necessarily know much about. I just think there's a tremendous, there's been a lot of confusion among various spokespeople who have tried to answer these questions, and I think it's been hard for them to get answers to the questions. Uh, but I have no doubt that about Lou's role in that program, as we reported in the Times. Um, I just think the nature of the program was kind of unusual and hard to pin down. Um, and so that's, and I just think there's been confusion from people who have been speaking out about it. Uh, um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of conflicts and contradictions. For instance, they, uh, they've told us as well that the program ended in 2012, which I know is not true. And we, we know, we, we reported that it's just not true, but I think that spokesperson really believed that because that's when the funding stopped for the program, the formal funding stopped in 2012. The people involved kept going, but that's the person from the Defense Department who was who was tasked with trying to answer this question came up with the answer of 2012 because that's when the funding started. And who knows where that person had to go to get that information to answer that question. So I just don't think it's a simple process for anybody who is trying to answer questions about the ATIP program. That's sort of my my sense of it. Oh, that's a that's a really good answer. And you know, those things have crossed my mind and you know, um Alejandro and I had a conversation about it. He kind of more or less said the same thing, uh, you know, uh similar to what you just said there. Uh we have one more call and it's gonna have to be a quick one. Gary from Oregon. Uh Masari, I know you've been waiting a long time, but we're gonna have to make this a quick one, Gary. Okay. Well, first off, thank you for all your work. You're- your sound voice in this in this culture. Well, and, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. And um, well, basically, I guess when's the follow up? When when's the next one? When's the you next mean, New York Times article? Yeah. Oh, oh, I as soon as we can get our hands on the information we need to put a story into the Times, it will happen. But you know, there's just there's just not a lot of opportunities for the kind of information we need. We just don't get it. We don't have it. Uh, we're digging around all the time. Um, so we just have to be patient. And as soon as something reveals itself or somebody comes to us with a story or some, you know, something else explosive comes up, comes up, we will report on it. But we're not like just sort of the internet where we can just sort of write about anything we want. You know, it has to be, as I was saying earlier, something uh, exclusive to the times, something new, something really uh, groundbreaking, something connected to the government. It's all these criteria that have to be filled. But right. we're on it, and we're always looking to do it again. So I hope we can. Okay, Leslie, uh, I, we have to end the show real quickly. I'm sorry, there's another guest um, coming up. That's fine. Uh, Grant Cameron. Thanks for having me on, Martin. You bet. It's been really fun. All, as always, it always is. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie, and you take care. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone, so that's it for the show this evening. Next, uh, speak of, speaking of Wright-Patterson, next week we have Ray Zizmanski on, and he's going to be talking about, he's a former insider um, at uh, Wright-Patterson, has some information. He's got a book called uh, 50, Gray, uh, 50 Shades of Grey. Anyway, thanks so much for listening, everyone. Stay well, 
and remember to keep your eyes to the sky.